So I just had a really good interview with John McAfee uh, from McAfee Antivirus Software. Um, it got a little weird in this interview and the audio video wasn't quite right. So I just went ahead and uh, delivered this video out here just to get it out there because my God, John McAfee is effing hilarious. So enjoy this next interview. Uh, today we've got a very special guest. He needs no introduction. But I'm going to introduce him anyways. This is the ever-famous John McAfee, the founder of McAfee Antivirus Software. Um, he's also been involved in a number of adventures. You'll remember him down in Belize. You'll remember his video from uh, Evolving Bath Salts. And today, we're going to be talking about all the happenings that are happening right now. In addition, we're going to be talking about the coronavirus. We're going to be talking about a software company and whatever else we can get in there. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. So, John. All right, then. I want, to ask, good. I want to ask you how you started your antivirus software company named after yourself. <laughs> <laughs> it was an opportunity that happens thousands of times per day <laughs> that I happen to latch on to. My brother-in-law in San, well, we were living actually in uh, <laughs> in Silicon Valley. My brother-in-law, who'd been living with us for a year, paying no rent, of course, and taking up space, was reading to me on a Sunday morning a, an article in the San Jose Mercury News about a computer virus. No one ever used that word before. No one. The writers of this virus two brothers in Lahore, Pakistan, named this piece of software the Pakistani brain virus. Virus. Well, what did this program do? It duplicated itself infinitely. And when it could do no further duplication. It killed itself. And the computer in which it inhaled. <laughs> no one had ever seen something like this before. The Pakistani brain. I was very well connected back then. I got a copy of that virus within 10 hours. I disassembled it, meaning I took it apart. I took it apart. I looked at it. How do you work? And I saw an architecture so fucked perfect so beautiful so incredibly correct the first artificial intelligence built by two brothers in Pakistan who owned a computer repair shop <laughs> Who, who would have thought? And I saw the perfection. I tried to hire those motherfuckers. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Did they create their own virus in order to service computers and increase like money? No, no. They just converted the virus to destroy every computer on the planet. The Pakistani brain the first virus, which would have done so had I not created <laughs> the first 
antivirus program, which looked for the package heavy brain and killed it. <laughs> so that was how the beginning did, of McAfee. Wait a minute. So how did how did you do that? Like how did you intercept a piece of code that was running in a process and then like stop its suspend its operation and then like wipe it from the computer? All right. The Pakistani brain, which was the first virus, was a, a boot sector virus, meaning when you, <laughs> when you booted up a computer in 1987, which is when that virus first appeared, it was on an IBM computer or whatever, um, it took the boot sector loaded it and the boot sector is supposed to have the boot strap process meaning you got I don't know, a few thousand bytes to load in the real operating system that's how computers worked the pakistani brain took the boot sector and replaced it <laughs> so goddamn brilliant, so goddamn brilliant, with a segment of code which loaded in an operating system which was <laughs> not beneficial, but purely evil. <laughs> this was the truth. However, when I got a copy of that file, I saw immediately, oh, well, this is how you stop it. It's fucking trivial. I wrote that program. I put it on my bulletin board system, home base, the largest bulletin board system in Silicon Valley, where I lived. That program. <laughs> reads 10 to 20 million users over them. That's how, this, that's how McAfee happened. A goddamn accident. Someone wrote a computer virus. These two brothers in the Pakistan. God damn it, I would love to have fired those motherfuckers. I got a copy. I took it apart. I figured out a way to fix it, wrote a program, put it out on my bulletin board system. And in two weeks, had 10 million users. Wow. The beginning, the beginning of my company. Wait a minute. So hold, let's let's stop late right there. That is incredible <laughs> scale. <laughs> All right. So is it now? Yeah. So wow. So first off, I can't believe that computers back in those days just allowed right access to the boot sector. But I guess they did because they didn't have any protections. In those no, days. of course they did. How could you disallow it? When you're in boot up, you you have to allow access to the boot sector. <laughs> so anybody who owns the boot sector owns your computer. <laughs> and a fucking story, baby. <laughs> right, but how but how did it infect the computer if the boot like your computer's on you insert a disc and then the virus writes to the boot sector was that allowed well, by the operating system or did they use it okay hack? here's how it worked you insert a disc and you boot up your computer or you just boot it up without a disc and you're booting up out of hard disk the virus is in control <laughs> you boot it up virus is in control now what yeah no, no 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 now what this is a question 
Okay, Nothing so you can fucking do to override the control that the virus has just achieved. How could you do? How could you override it? Easy. You run a program, <laughs> which, which. <laughs> Read the, the boot, the boot sector, and then overwrite it with the original boot sector. <laughs> I'm that's sorry. It. I'm sorry. I'm laughing. That's, that's it. That's, that's all it was. That's all it was. That's how trivial McAfee antivirus began. <laughs> well, okay. Let's go find the original boot sector <laughs> and override it. Do you understand? I do. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's really simple. That was like it. you just—that was it. You know. All right. So your well, no, that was not it. Because a month later, a month later, a new type of virus emerged called the Jerusalem virus, which did not affect boot sectors no <laughs> what it did <laughs> is take every application on your system <laughs> and insert in front <laughs> of the application a set of control functions which gave control of the application to the virus, not the application. Would the application still run as normal? Oh, absolutely, yes. It was called, the second computer virus was called the Jerusalem virus. So two brothers in Pakistan had created the Pakistan, Pakistani brain. Well, I figured out a fix for that. Trivial. End of story. <laughs> Five million people were using that application that I wrote. Then came the Jerusalem virus. It doesn't affect the boot sector. It affects the applications. How? Pick an application. Flashlight. <laughs> When you picks. branch to flashlight, when you branch to flashlight, you don't actually branch to flashlight. You branch to a program that has been inserted by the virus that runs flashlight as a virtual sim simulation. <laughs> no, this is how tragic your systems are people. I cannot begin to tell you how fragile your security, your anonymity, and your privacy actually are. And this is where we're headed. I've been talking about sector viruses, program viruses, far deeper. It's all the same thing. So I got a question. It is to do to, to, it is to, let me finish, to delude you into believing that your actions, your thoughts, your feelings actually matter. They don't. I would be happy to pursue them with you, my friend. Well, you let's, let's dive deeper. What do you mean by that? <laughs> that reality as you see it 
is an illusion that you and those who are watching, if any, <laughs> I have no way of knowing, doesn't matter. You, my friend, do you know what is real and what is not? Because I guarantee you, you do not. You get your information from one source, the mainstream media. I mean, or, I don't, but we'll, we, can, we can continue, we can continue well, with that or, assumption. Or from another source, let's, let's assume it's not the mainstream media. It is an equally unverifiable source of truth. There is a mainstream media of whatever you think is the truth coming to you through channels that are not MSM. No, I, I insist they're both the same. That truth is something you cannot fucking touch without leaving your house, leaving the world of convention, leaving the world of facts, and diving into something, someplace, somewhere, <laughs> where no one before you has ever dived into, then maybe you and I can exchange truths that actually fucking matter. You're talking about a matrix, like we're in a matrix. If you, if you wish. <laughs> Listen, my friend, <laughs> I care less what word, phrase, sentence, description you wish to apply to this. I'm just saying the absolute fucking truth. Okay, well, what can you tell us about the absolute truth? Like, obviously, the things that we think are all contained within a space of which we're allowed to explore. And so the discourse that's allowed online is the containment of where we're allowed to think. Right? Would you, would you agree with that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Don't know. This, this is what I know. I'm 74 years old. <laughs> My latest incarcer incarceration is eight months ago with my wife Janice in the D Dominican Republic, which they said, <laughs> you have to go back to America. One month prior to that, we were in Cuba. Jazz and I are called into <laughs> the Cuban government and told by a general, the United States government <laughs> has asked for us to return you to America. We said no. But, but you are now an embarrassment to us and you must leave within 72 hours. Wow. And prior to that, the Bahamas, which we only escaped by five fucking hours before we landed in Cuba, 
No. <laughs> no. There are no words. There's no uh, written communication. No. No story. No. No. Video. It could possibly explain what has happened to Janice, Janice and I in the past five months. Other than we, we are free from confinement, unlike the Dominican Republic, which for four days kept us in the most horrific conditions of the third world jails for four goddamn days. And this, <laughs> I'm not complaining. I mean, I was in a Guatemala jail for five fucking weeks. <laughs> Why? Why? Why did they? Why have you been in jail in all of these different countries? Well, in the Dominican Republic, because America wants me back to charge me with crimes against the Internal Revenue Service and the Securities Exchange Commission. <laughs> well, fuck you. I ain't coming back with that. Uh, so, yeah, we were arrested for fucking days. And by the way, people, those of you who are interested in a jail experience, please <laughs> do not go to the Dominican Republic. I mean, I've been in jail in Guatemala, Belize, America. Bahamas, you fucking name it. But nothing in my experience rivals the Dominican Republic. So those of you want a, a, a jail experience, move a little bit west into Mexico. I don't know, the very fine uh, um, only for misdemeanors. If you're talking about felonies of uh, you know, five years or well, I, I, I can't help you. I have no experience. But the felony, the felonies, the two days to one month. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> I am uh, the master in that. And you do not ever, under any circumstances, want to be in a Dominican Republic jail uh, for more than two days. Well, now, I now say. I've got to ask, why is that? What is so bad about a jail in the Dominican Republic? Imagine. A jail. It has no glass in the windows, just iron bars that are rusted. There's no water, there's no bathroom, there's no toilet. Uh, you shit in a fucking hole in the floor, <laughs> which nobody manages to achieve. Um, Food comes once a day. If you have no friends, you starve to death. Sorry, that's the way jail is. They don't feed you. What you think in the in the Dominican Republic jail every fucking day someone comes around with food? No, ain't no food. You got no friends, no family, no. No loved ones, you starve to death. Now that's problem number one. 
No, that, that doesn't happen for 30, 40, or 50 days. Now you start to, you die from lack of more water. <laughs> what does that mean? In a Dominican Republic fucking jail. No people. So now you're in a, a Dominican jail. What are your chances of survival? 50-50, maybe. Janice and I survived. We got sent to London, where on the way, I said, baby, Janice, we cannot continue this. The CIA got to the Dominican Republic before. We arrived, we're done for, unless we go underground. Now, since January of 2019, <laughs> nobody, my friend, knows where we are not our family, our brothers, our sisters, our children, our fathers, our mothers. No, no fucking one knows where we are. This is our reality. Do you want to show me yours? I'm, I'm in Costa Rica. Um, I'm escaping, you know, the worst <laughs> of the coronavirus, whether it's real or whether it's an intelligence operation or a mix of both. It could be a mix of both. Uh, I'm not really sure. It ain't but... real. It's not, it's not real. Please, people, wake the fuck up. Listen, how many people have died from coronavirus? Well, I promise you, as of today, date less than 100,000 in this same period, 630,000 people died from the flu. One point. One million died from diarrhea. Six million died from starvation. And you're telling me this is a world fucking problem. Wake the fuck up. People. No, I apologize for <laughs> my, 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 my outrage, but it's real. Wake up, people. So, John, what's really going on with the coronavirus? What's really going on with coronavirus? Well, of the 100 million things that could be going on with coronavirus, let's look at this one. <laughs> Number one, tired of being dissed, disrespected, uh, hated by the rest of the world. Why? <laughs> because China produces all of our fucking goods. Uh, so China, being tired <laughs> of 
being disrespected, decided, listen, fuck you, people. I know what you're about. You're afraid. You're frightened. You sit in your goddamn caves or your offices or homes waiting for something that you can be afraid of. Then the Chinese are saying, okay, here's, why don't we do this? Let's lock down <laughs> Wuhan, which is the equivalent of Silicon Valley in America. So they lock it down against a virus that's airborne. Now, this, in my mind, would have been perfect if the Chinese had lowered God damned dome over the city of Wuhan, which, to my knowledge, <laughs> did not happen. So anyone who had the viruses in Wuhan and sneezes, sneezes. A chew. The, the, dot, the droplets in that air can be carried 100 miles. Now, I, I did not see a dome. Hang on a second, baby. Am I, am I out of time? No, you're fine. Okay. Since I did not see a dome dropping, <laughs> I, I, I must assume that none did. Therefore, the Chinese are fucking with us. And we, as ignorant, stupid, scared sheep of the Western world go, ooh, oh, yes, they're containing the virus. Now, I didn't even notice that China has no more problem. No, we, we're done with it. No more infections. Everything is fine. And they're back to work. Mm -hmm. And we are just beginning our fucking isolations. Does anybody see the obvious error in our assumptions? <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm sorry. My wife has just said I am out of time. One more question. One more question, baby. Do not shoot me. <laughs> All right, John. I got one more question. Bitch. Um, would, yes. Would the people that are offering the cure be the ones that have released this virus? <laughs> what? One more time. The people that are offering the cure, are they the ones that might have released the problem, the virus? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, I, I, I can't stop this video. Anyway, um, no, no, please. Do you understand how simplistic uh, that would be? That we have the cure, therefore we are the savior, and therefore we are the winners. No. <laughs> Those uh, will not be the winners. This is way more complex than uh, what we believe. What we find our sustenance, our comfort, our hope, our dream. There is no such thing. <laughs> I'm sorry to say, you're on your own. However, be on your own 
can you not wake up to one thing you are being manipulated by the press, by your government, by the rules, regulations, and expectations upon your behavior. And I will leave you at that. I'm sorry if that is not sufficient. Oh, it is. I believe, I believe it should be. I believe in my heart it should be. And, and thank you. And you, by the way, my friend. Yes. <laughs> I have started a list of a few people who I have done podcasts with. Please contact my wife, Janice. Tell her that I have selected you as one that I would like to interview with again. Thank, well, thank you. you. All right, thank you. There you go. It's the famous John McAfee, founder of McAfee Antivirus Software, giving his opinion on current events. And uh, wow, there's some things that we didn't expect, but um, there they are. And John, <laughs> we wish you luck there in you your uh, presidential 2020 uh, campaign. Is there anything you'd like to plug? Uh, before we leave this segment. Do only what you love. Nothing else. Nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, John. Take care. Well, there you have it. Uh, John McAfee is as unique and interesting as the rumors say that he is. Uh, well, anyways, uh, that's the interview. I hope that you like it. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments section or give me a like. And uh, if you like this, I'll make more. So, all right. Well, this is Zach, the Google Whistleblower, coming at you from Costa Rica. Tune in for next time. Bye now.